We're good? Okay. Uh, good, uh, good afternoon, members of council, as well as Williamsburg County citizens, and our guests that are here today um, via in-house as well as uh, online uh, via Zoom. Uh, we are here, obviously, to discuss um, our finance and budget committee meeting. Um, I'm happy that uh, all count, or a good bit of our council members have been here, are, are here today to attend this meeting. Um, and we're going to go ahead and get started. We have a lot of information for today, and we are tr going to try to get through it um, as quickly as possible. It's much different than a normal council meeting because of the uh, degree of things that we have here. So I'm going to officially call this meeting to order. Again, that's the Finance and Budget Committee meeting for today, Thursday, May 13th, 2021 at 1 p.m. Invocation will be delivered by... Yes, <laughs> Councilman Woods. Thank you, um, Madam Supervisor. Let us pray. Our Heavenly Father, we, we thank you for life, health, and strength. We thank you for the opportunity to come before you another time, Heavenly Father, and asking you to guide us as we attempt to go through this meeting. But first of all, let us thank you for being so kind, gracious, and merciful toward us. You watched over us from the last time we meet up until this present time. And we just want to take this opportunity to say thank you. Thank you, Heavenly Father. We know that we don't deserve the blessing that you bestowed upon us, but you've done it anyhow, and we just want to say thank you. Now, as we enter into this meeting today, we want to ask that you guide our minds, guide our thoughts. And Heavenly Father, we ask that the things that we do and the things that we say, even the thoughts that we think, be pleasing in your sight and beneficial to the county of Williamsburg. These and many other blessings we pray in the mighty name of Jesus. Amen. Amen. Thank you, Councilman Woods. Um, our first item that is on our agenda. Um, first, um, I need to get a motion to amend the agenda to include the Chavis One Stop Project update for members of council. So moved, Madam. So moved, Madam Chair. And a second. Second. Any discussion? Hearing none, all those in favor of amending the agenda to include the items um, of Chavis One Stop Update, please signify by raising your hand. Opposers the same. The ayes have it. Also, I need to make note that at the bottom of our agenda where it says budget review and revisions, it's supposed to be for second, or from sorry, for third reading and not second reading. So just a point of, point of notice. Um, we have in, in our um, areas or in our chambers today our, our Williamsburg County annual debt service presentation that will be done by Mr. Brian Nurek um, from Compass Municipal Advisory LLC and Ms. Francina, or we call her Franny Heiser, law firm of Burr, Foreman, and McNair. You all may um, uh, come forward and present your presentation to members of council and finance. It is great to be with y'all this afternoon. It's a beautiful day in, in Williamsburg County. Um, I am Franny Heiser. I, uh, <clears throat> excuse me, have been privileged to work with the county for many, many years. I do the legal work when you borrow money. Uh, Mr. Nurick does the numbers. And I'm here today in case after you hear from Brian and his numbers, y'all have any legal questions. I, I, I think we're, you're going to have a great report today, and uh, I'm just glad to be able to be part of the team. And I'm going to turn it over to Brian because he's got all the good news. Good to see everyone. Thank you for inviting me to uh, be back here today. Um, the last time I was here was the fall of 2019, and uh, we, we had some robust discussions then. It took me, I think, just over an hour to go through all the material. So I noticed I got 30 minutes, so I'm going to hit the highlights. Um, I will be back. Um, I'm planning to be back in front of you in the fall of this year, which will be back normal schedule because we missed the fall of 2020. But during 2020, um, I'm calling today a celebration. We, we, we did some really, really incredible things that we're going to go over. Um, the county's in a great spot. Um, you're going to see here today that you've got some, um, some cash flow to work with in terms of as you work through your budget, as you work through your capital needs. We've, we've held the line strong, and, and you have some flexibility now. 
and now it's time to put that to work um, from my perspective. Uh, we identify needs and then we come up with a financial solution for those needs. So your job is to identify needs and my job is to get them funded. Um, and I'm going to show you what kind of room we have here. Um, we put a lot of time and effort with your um, administration to put this book together with a cover page that breaks out six core debt functions that you operate. The first one is all your general obligation bonds and equipment leasing, which is paid for from debt service millage. So that 29.7 mils that's on those tax bills, that's what it's repaying is debt that's issued um, and repaid um, in item number one. Number two is the same concept except it's for fire protection. So at times you issue fire protection bonds to fund um, various projects and those are paid from a dedicated fire protection millage. And then number three is referendum approved general obligation bonds which are repaid by your local option sales tax. And after that, I'm not going to go into them today. I'm going to save them for the fall because there's really not a core update to give you. But um, number four, you have um, heavy equipment leasing that um, has not had any changes since the last time I was here. You also have your hospital revenue bonds that haven't had any um, activity or changes since I was last here. And then we don't monitor all the debt, but um, uh, because it's through USDA, but you have waterworks in uh, sewer revenue, um, system revenue bonds that are um, essentially between you and the USDA. So there's really not a whole lot for, uh, for me to be working on on those, so we're not uh, putting a lot of time in, in, into that. But we do notate for you all the debt that's outstanding so you can see um, a one-page snapshot of all those loans. Um, all the pages in this document at the bottom right have a number so we can all um, stay together. Uh, so what I want to do now is I want to start with um, item number one. And if we go to page number two, the title of that page in the top left will say debt capsule report, debt service millage. So there are five loans, five pieces of debt that we repay from your debt service millage levy each year. And the most um, recent one is at the bottom, it's the 2020 IPRB, which stands for Installment Purchase Revenue Bonds Refunding, REF stands for Refunding. And that is the, the, the big transaction that we had been working towards to refinance for you and to create capacity. And the, about the only good thing from COVID is interest rates were low. And um, at the same time, COVID created a credit um, analysis issue that really had to be well managed. And I would say well managed, very well managed. Because getting access to funds, it wasn't that it was difficult, is that everyone wanted to see liquidity. Everyone wanted to know what happens if property taxes don't come in. What happens if there's a drop off in sales taxes? What, you know, how does that affect the community and your ability to repay debt, your ability to operate? And on that line item, on that row, we identify a number of items. First is the bond series. Second is uh, the, the basic purpose. But number three is, is your bond rating. So those bonds had a bond rating of A- minus from Standard & Poor's. Your general obligation bond rating is A flat. So those bonds are always one notch below your general obligation bonds. And last time when I was here in the fall of 19, we talked a little bit about your credit ratings and, and the fact that we have good credit rating with Standard & Poor's. We're not as happy with Moody's, but we decided we're not going to use them anymore. Um, so we haven't had any robust discussions with Moody's, but we held the line in the middle of COVID with your credit rating, which is a huge achievement. Um, very, very proud that we were able to get to that result. There was a lot of credit work back and forth between um, all the parties of the working group and the analysts in New York that rated the transaction and took it to their committee. And uh, that paved the way for us to then go to market and issue that debt and refinance those bonds for this facility that we're currently in. What I'd like to do is turn to the next page, page three, and this is, the, this is the page that 
shows the math of what the result was net to the county. So under the blue columns, we identify the prior bond payments, which was the 2010 bonds that we repaid um, or refinanced. And you can see the total payments over the life uh, that of what was left at the time would add up to $40 million. $576,000 around it. Under the, the, the pinkish columns called new bond payments, those will be the new payments post the refunding, so after we refinanced, and you can see they add up to $33.9 million. And then the last column is the green column, that's the savings. You can see that net of all expenses to issue that debt your savings over the life of that bond issue was in excess of $6.6 .6 million. That is a large number for the size of the transaction. Down below, um, under net savings amount, where you get to the bluish column, uh, bluish heading, you can see the gross savings, you can see the present value of that, but then you get to the what we call the net present value savings as a percentage, and it's 18.3%. The, the, the industry that, that I work in, that is a significant number because if that number is in the three to 5% range, that says go forward. Let me say that again, three to 5% range means go forward. We hit 18.3. I think it might be the largest percentage that I've seen in, in quite some time. I mean, that is a monster of a savings. And off to the right, just to narrow it down to the just interest rate, we went from a 4.49% interest rate to a 2.3% interest rate, which is a net reduction of 2.19% or 219 basis points. That's a monster. I mean, we just locked in 20-year rates at 2.3%. So all the hard work comes down to that. Now, I want to recognize the, the, the team because this, is, this bond issue is probably gonna be one of the largest bond issues that the county issues for, for quite some time. Um, the team included your bond counsel, Franny Heiser with Burr Foreman McNair. Uh, your county attorney, Billy Jenkinson, had a key role in this financing. Um, we wouldn't have been able to pull it off with Larry Finney, who I know was on, on the Zoom call. He really helped us with the credit process, was on all the calls to help discuss the, the general fund and the operational side of things. Um, Dr. Wright, right here in front of me, did an amazing job, especially on the rating calls. And then our rock, our rock of the team is Miss Liz Nelson. Without Liz, none of this is going to happen. So I, I really want to I want to congratulate the whole team, and I want to give an extra special recognition recognition to Liz Nelson for her job in helping us achieve this. It would not have happened. She was working from home all the time, getting emails and and answering them, and it was just this is just a great achievement. So so this is my celebration day. Um, so this is the savings page. If we move to page four. You can see that this is all your payments going forward and in the past on a graph format. And you can see in, in, in the turquoise, in kind of the going forward, that it's very level, right? It, it's very level, it drops down, continues to be level, then it drops down again when you get out to the later years. But in 2021, so in fiscal year 2021, when you look at that bar, this is a little bit lower, that's savings that occurred from the bond issue, and what that's done is it's allowed us to build the cash balance in the debt service fund to ensure that we have, um, and you know, a buttress in case there's ever a, a, a collection problem or a delay. We now have a little bit more funds in that fund for us to make sure that we keep that projection of 29.7 mils, and that was a very strategic thing that we did. To, um, to ensure the long-term um, health of this, this program. But you can see that beginning in 2022, um, when I'm doing the math, what the, the millage rate differential between 29.7 and 26.6 in one year, 26.3 is, and what that creates is additional room for us to issue additional bonds to the extent you have needs. 
And so let's identify um, a little bit further what that means. So uh, I'm going to skip page five because page five is simply all the math behind the graph. So each bond issue individually, each year you can see what the payments are. And page six is how we calculate the collectible value of a mill each year. And as soon as we get through 2021 and we reconcile bank accounts, we'll update that column for the fall meeting, when we, more like November meeting. So we will update that for you and you can see um, the growth in the value of a mill each year. And then we get to page seven. And the title of page seven is Millage Summary Report Debt Service Millage. And what we identify here under column A is each fiscal year. Under column B is the tax year, the fall of which the notices of taxes go out. Uh, column C is that um, value per mill that we identified on the prior page. And then we have some projections going forward with a 1% growth rate. And then we re go to E and F, F being the debt service payments that are pulled forward from those prior pages that we just looked at. Uh, column G is our target. Our target is 29.67 mills. And then the math of what the debt service payment is versus um, what the value of a mill is, our projection of the minimum levy it would need to be. Uh, and then we have the differential, kind of what's left over between the target and the, um, you know, the minimum levy that we need. And so you can see in fiscal year ending 22, you have $255,000 of unused millage at this time. So we could either let that roll to the debt service fund and we'll use it another time, or we can issue debt against it. And each year there's, it grows. You can see the, the number under column I, each particular year you go grow. So hypothetically, if you wanted to do a, a 10 year bond issue out of your 8%, then you could issue about $1.5 million without a tax increase. And so if you have needs that you all identify that add up to 500,000 or you have needs that add up to 750,000 or a million, we can start working um, to, to look, to see what a new debt issuance would look like, okay? Column, I'm sorry, page eight is your constitutional debt limit. So in order to issue debt, we have to have the debt capacity under state law your, your assessed valuation times 8% minus the 8% uh, bonds that are outstanding, as well as the annual payment on the installment purchase revenue bonds. And you can see, based upon the math, the far right column, column J, in each particular year, how much debt limit you have available. So if you wanted to issue bonds right today, we'd have 1.3 million available to you. Next year, 1.7 year after that, 2.1, 2.5, 2.9. So you have this combination of the growth in your assessed valuation and the repayment of existing 8% um, bonds. So um, we've, got, we've got some room, right? We've identified cash flow room uh, and we've identified um, some debt limit room. And um, so from my perspective, I think that we have continued to move the county forward with um, Function number one, your debt service millage program. Uh, and I think you all should be very proud of, of where you're at and the um, flexibility that this refunding um, has, um, you know, has uh, put forth for you, okay? So before I move to, to item number two, which will be the fire protection, does anyone have any questions on this section? No? Okay. Mr. D just a quick question, Mr. Durie. And I just want to make sure I'm reading this right. You're saying we've got 1.3 million debt service capacity that we could and we could tap into, but you're not recommending that we do. It's just there, correct? It is there. Right. I'm not giving a recommendation on whether you should or shouldn't. Right. Um, if you all have needs, which I don't know because I'm not part of the capital projects but, uh, part. And I'm asking, since we're locked into this 20-year rate, each year that we don't, that debt capacity increases it rolls over into the following year and would increase it it increases the 1.3 doesn't carry forward and then gets added to the next number but it increases in value increases a little year. bit each okay. year yes and that was my question thank you so yes. much thank you any other questions okay so i'm gonna move to the next section which will start on page 11. 
So you have um, the title of this page is Debt Capsule Report, Fire Protection, Debt Service Millage. There are two bond issues outstanding um, related to this. One is from 2015, a USDA loan. And the other is in 2020, we did a refunding of a 2010 loan that created an interest cost savings and, and, and provided some additional flexibility in, um, in uh, this program as well. The reason that we highlighted the 2015 bond is that the current interest rate under column F is 3.5%. And we think that um, there's a possibility we could get a lower rate just like we did with the 2020. So we would recommend that council approve an ordinance um, authorizing the issuance of a refunding bond for fire protection. Now, if you have additional needs for fire protection, it would also be a good time to issue that debt so you only pay one fee, you have a slightly larger loan, and you get um, you know, more economies of scale, more bang for your, your dollar. So um, I am recommending that we move forward with the refunding of that bond, and I'm also recommending that y'all um, think through any capital needs, any capital project needs you have for fire protection, and, um, and you know, bring those to the table and, and see if there's a new money component that could be added to the ordinance if appropriate. Um, to give you some idea of the amount of cash flow you have, let's do the same thing we just did with the last section, which is on page 12, we have the graph of all your debt payments, and you can see you're at 7.85 mils, and then the debt drops down a little bit when you get to the orange uh, bars, and that's due to that refunding. So if we refinance the 2015 bond, we might drop them down a little bit more. Page 13 is just the math behind that graph. And then we move to page um, 14, which is the millage value year by year and the change. And then most importantly, page 15 is where we look at our cash flow. So page 15 is the millage summary report, fire protection, debt service millage. Um, the highlighted row is fiscal year ending 2022, tax year 21, so the tax bills that go out this fall, estimated value of a mill just over $70,000. And as you scroll over to the right, you can see we have about $115,000 of cash flow in one year that is available um, to be utilized. And so if if I took that and just times it by 10 and backed out some amount for interest, we're looking at about a half a million dollars, $750,000, somewhere in there that you could issue without a tax increase for fire protection. And so I would, I would recommend that um, as part of approving an ordinance to do the refunding, which obviously without any new money makes sense. If there is some need for fire protection um, capital projects, it would be a good time to put those two together and, and see if we can't get some economies of scale. Okay. Um, any questions on this section? Okay. Um, we're going to move to the third and final section for today, which um, is page 18, it starts. And this is our um, referendum debt local option sales tax repaid debt, um, the debt capsule report at the top left, debt capsule report, local option sales tax. We have one bond issue outstanding uh, for 12.5 million. There's around 8 million left out outstanding on that loan. Um, got a great interest rate, 2.7%, and you can see the bond rating under column C is that A flat. So the GO rating is A flat, and then the installment purchase revenue bonds, which are annual appropriation debt, they're not tax um, back debt um, is one notch under at the A minus. So, um, you know, just again, I just want to hammer home the, the credit rating because holding the credit rating through COVID was a, a really good achievement. Um, page 19 is the graph of the debt, the principal and interest payments each year. Um, page 20 is the, um, is the math behind the graph. It's just those payments in, in spreadsheet form. And then we get to page 21, which is really the, the cash flows that everyone is most interested in. Um, under column A, we have the um, various periods during the life of the sales tax from period number one all the way to period number 96 on the, the third page. So we, we update this 
Um, every so often as we get actual sales tax data and we put those in month by month and then we take the last 12 months average and then we carry it forward because part of this program is um, funds from borrowed the, the, the referendum we've got some um, funds that are part as pay as you go and the pay as you go are ever evolving right if we're collecting more in sales tax we can do more projects if we collect less in sales tax we will have less projects so um, under column I I list the pay-as-you-go amount for each of the particular fiscal years so every fiscal year we end that year we certify and then we can release funds that well, release sales tax monies to be used for pay-as-you-go and I'm going to fast forward to the third page, or I'm sorry, I'm going to fast forward to the second page, page 22, and I want to identify period number 47 under column A. It's highlighted in purple. And you can see if you scroll across under column D that there is an increase of the average collectible amount per month. So it was below $200,000 last time I was here and now it has moved just above two hundred thousand dollars so we're collecting more than projected which is always good we want to be conservative going in and we want to hopefully beat expectations um, so we're projecting no growth so that 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 you know most likely we'll probably see some growth in our favor but for pro forma, pro forma purposes we're projecting no growth and that paygo amount continues to grow and if you go to the last page page 23 you can see that PAYGO amount under column I adds up to $4,146,000 over the life of the sales tax. And at the bottom right, as I know this is the most important part that everyone wants to see, we identify all the amounts that are estimated to be available for projects. So we have the original 2017 bond anticipation notes, just under $6 million. We have the, the permanent debt that was issued and, and repaid those bond anticipation notes and issued additional new money of the $6.2 million. We've got some PAYGO funds that have been released already of $700,000. And then we just simply add up the, the 21 through 25 PAYGO amounts for the 3.4, which 700,000 plus the 3.4 will equal that, I, that column I number. Um, for a grand total of $16.4 million. So uh, we're estimating right now through the life of the program, you'll be able to spend a total of $16.4 million on projects. Okay, and that number has increased since the last time I ran this report. And uh, hopefully I'll keep this report and keep me honest when I come in the fall in November and we'll have another update for you and we can, we can see you know, what, what that number's grown to. Okay, but I know you all have, have ongoing projects with this program, and uh, this is uh, you know kind of hot off the press, latest and greatest numbers. Uh, we just received new sales tax numbers from Department of Revenue. Do we have any questions on item number three? This is the one I thought I'd get the most questions on. <laughs> Okay. Well, I, I did have a question. Yes, ma'am. Um, I'm new to council this year. So my question is, and it may be directed towards the supervisor, um, with that 16.4 being available, 16.4 million, is that taken into account that monies we already have set aside for projects that we're working on or have done? Or is... 16.4 is, is the, the number. So it's 16.4 minus however much you've already spent. Okay. All right. And then the, that net, I don't know, I don't, I'm not on the, I'm not on the expenditure side. So okay. you would have to work with your staff to, to get the, the net 16.4 minus how much you've spent and then how much is left. Thanks for clearing that up. Cause I'm sure people that are watching uh, via Facebook would need to know that. Yeah. <laughs> right. Any other questions? Okay. Well, that's going to conclude um, my presentation. As I stated, the other um, four, five, and six um, do not need to be going, gone over today. Uh, hopefully, I'm within my 30-minute um, time limit because I know uh, Mr. Finney needs to talk to y'all about some of the operational side. But um, in closing, uh, you know, thank you for trusting me. Thank you for uh, trusting the team. Uh, we performed. Um, the, the the working group 
nailed it, and uh, you know we now get to to uh, um, you know to the to the victors go the spoils. So you know we've got a little bit of room, and I hope to come back here and and you know talk about some exciting projects for y'all to finance. Thank you, Mr. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you to the entire team. That's a very encouraging report. Looks Thank very you. good. Thank you for your hard work and, and the rest of the team as well. Thank you very much. Brian, before you leave, can you just address that this is on the debt service side of county operation and not the general fund? Yes. Yeah, I'd be happy to. So just to make sure everyone's clear, um, I am only working on the debt side. So I'm only working on debt service millage collections and where those go, fire protection millage collections and where those go, sales tax collections and where those go. I am not working on operating millage and where that goes. So there is a whole other side, that's the, the operational side, which is what Mr. Finney's um, expertise is in and what his group is helping manage. So when you think of the debt side, you think of Compass, you think of Burr Foreman McNair, and when you think of the operation side, it's your administration working with uh, Mr. Finney's group um, to manage that side. Okay? Thank you. Thank you. Well, that was certainly encouraging news. Our next order of business is going to be um, information. Thank you. Information that will. Okay, good. I want to make sure you say information that will be um, discussed with our financial advisor, Mr. Larry Finney, CPA for Green Finney LLP. Um, and again, as I stated earlier, he's Williamsburg County's financial advisor on the operations side. Hello, Mr. Finney. Can you hear me? Hello, everybody. Yes, Dr. Wright, I can hear you. Great. Can you hear, can you hear me okay? Yes, yes. All right. I am. Uh, um, can you can you allow me to share my screen, Dr. Wright? Yes, they're doing it right now. Okay. Great. Thank you. Mm -hmm. All right. Can you see that? Can you see the screen? Yes, you could. Um just maximize it. Yeah, that's oh. what I'm trying to do. There we go. There you go. There you go. Good afternoon, everybody. Um, I wish I could be there, um, and I was planning on being there until uh, until we had a little issue with with gas supply. Um, I don't know what it's like down there, but it's pretty crazy up here. So, um, Thought it might thought it might be best to just go ahead and do this by Zoom. So thank thank you for your patience with that. Um, what I would like to do is to give you a little bit of an update in terms of the county's um, operational financial condition as it relates to general fund. Um, I had the opportunity to meet with many of you on an individual basis. Um, last summer or in and early fall and obviously we're we're nine or ten months down the road now and we are very close to wrapping up the 2020 audit matter of fact we've got a draft of the financial statements and so hopefully we'll be able to wrap that up pretty soon and we're planning on coming to you in june um, to, to share that information with you but what I'd like to do today is to, to share with you in terms of kind of where the county's at and um, what's happened. And from our perspective, what's really, what's really um, brought the county to where it is financially. So um, feel free to fire away with questions as I walk through this. Um, I don't think this will take too long, and I'll be glad to also any, answer any questions that you have um, after this. So if you look at the last three years, and, and we've really kind of focused on the, on the last three years in terms of, of what we've looked at um, since we've been involved, um, we're talking about 2018, 19, and 20, and you can see that um, the county's financial condition has continued to uh, uh, to get worse. So over that three-year period, 
your unassigned fund balance has decreased by about two and a half million dollars. Um, your general fund unassigned fund balance as a percentage of your annual expenditures, um, which is the way we really like to look at it, has decreased from 19.3%, which is uh, about two and a, not quite two and a half months. Um, now at the at the end of the fiscal year 2020 to about 8.4%, which is about one month. Um, and obviously, you know, the counties continued to have to issue the three and a half million dollars in tax anticipation notes to continue to have the cash to, to pay, uh, pay expenses until the tax revenue starts coming in again. So um, with that as kind of the big picture perspective, so, you know, what we talked about last summer and, and early fall, really even before the, this current fiscal year started, was the things that the county needs to continue to do and the things the county has done, primarily on the expenditure side, to, to try to, to minimize fund balance continuing to decrease. So as you're well aware, these are some of the things that, um, that the county has already done and continues to do. Um, but my concern, well, and then, so let me talk about this. And this is where I think the rubber really meets the road. So <clears throat> if we go back to the last operating millage increase that occurred at the county, that was the 2006-2007 fiscal year. And so if we look at what's happened from the end of 2007 calendar year through the, the end of 2020, and the reason I'm using calendar year is because that's how the information is available um, from the government. Inflation over that 13 year period has been just over 60%. Um, at the same time, um, the county population has also decreased, and these are just rough numbers, but we were at about 35,000 back in 2005. Um, the, the last number I saw for 2020 was, was just under 30,000. Um, one thing I think it's really important to, to note when we talk about the population decrease is, and the reason I put that in there is obviously that affects assessed, assessed values and therefore property tax revenue. But at the same time, um, the county, ju just because the population has, has gone down a little bit, the county's, it's important to remember that the county still has to continue providing those services that, that they they are providing and, and have provided. And then obviously one of the other challenges that y'all have is that um, you are definitely one of the, the larger, uh, more rural counties in the state, which obviously presents some challenges as well. So overall inflation has been about 60%. If you look at your expenditures over that Gen that general same time period, again, now we're looking at calendar, I mean, fiscal year, not calendar year, but over that 13 year period, the ca overall county expenditures have increased uh, about 66, a little over 66%. Well, when you consider that two of your big expenditures ha have definitely increased at a higher rate, that being healthcare and retirement, um, that 66% is, is really pretty reasonable when you look at inflation being, general inflation being 60%. Um, and I specifically have pointed out what's happened on the public safety cost side of it, because I'm going to come back to that um, in just a few minutes. But the public safety side of that, as far as the expenses are concerned, during that same 13-year period has actually increased about 103%. Now let's look at the revenue side of the equation. So during that same 13 year period, um, fiscal year 07 to fiscal year 2020, county revenue overall has increased 32%. Tax revenue has only gone up 11.8%. And so 
I think a, a major, major reason that the county financial condition has worsened is that we're talking about approximately 70% of the general fund revenue of the county being tax revenue having just increased 11.8% while the overall costs have gone up about five times that. So let's just talk a little bit about from, again, from the Green Finney perspective, what we feel like that means and some things that we would really like for you to think about and consider and, and even some recommendations that we have. Um, so these are some things that I know that you as a council and that, that management has, has talked about, is continuing to talk about, but I just want to keep these in front of you. Obviously, you as a county, especially being a very large rural county, um, probably have more facilities than, than what you might typically see. So, you know, we would just encourage you to continue to look at how you consolidate those facilities to to decrease your operating costs you know I know that the the county team is always looking at where you can continue to cut other costs especially as it comes to the people side of it because obviously salaries and benefits are a, a very significant piece of your your total expenses um, but I think that without us addressing the revenue side of the equation for the county, y'all have worked so hard over the last, especially the last couple years to really try to cut costs. There's only so much of that you can do before services um, are really gonna start to get impacted. And so as a result of that, we would really like for you, we really want to come and talk to you about the revenue side of the equation and some things to, to consider and that we want to recommend. Because obviously you can only cut costs so much before you, it just, it doesn't make sense to continue to do that. Um, the other challenge that Williamsburg County has is that while you have not raised taxes operating millage taxes for 13 years at the same time what's also impacted what's happened to you financially is the fact that um, you haven't had significant growth and as a result when you put those two things together um, from our perspective it really becomes almost impossible to try to maintain a healthy financial condition so Let's talk a little bit about what we really we really want to recommend for you to consider. Um, and we're going to I'm going to talk about it in, in basically two buckets. One is that um, and, and let me stop before before I get into this. Um, it's a it's a somewhat similar discussion as we had with your utility rates. If you remember when we talked about increasing um, your utility rates, we were in a, the county was in, in a similar situation where the, the, the utility financial condition was getting worse and it had been a long time since those rates had been increased. And so what happened there and why I believe what's happening here is it's all catching up with us. And we're at a point that we've really got to consider doing something different. So as a result, what we want to recommend that the county consider um, is, is two buckets. One is looking at what you can do based on state law. And for the 21-22 fiscal year, the year we're getting ready to start here in a month and a half or so, is to look at, at just simply doing what state law allows. And then the second thing is to consider instituting a public safety fee. As you saw earlier, um, by far and away, the expenses that are increasing faster than, than anything else has been the public safety side of it. And so 
instituting a public safety fee, we believe would be a great way to get those funds specifically to your public safety departments where they're really needed. So on the state law side of it, as far as what you can do, there's two pieces to it. One is you are allowed to not just um, increase the millage based on the percentage for the current year, um, which is a combination to remind you, it's a combination of inflation, increase in inflation. And if there has been an increase in your population, which there hasn't been, that would also get added. So basically what the county's looking at is just the inflation percentage. You're not only, you're allowed to not only take advantage of what that would be for the current year, but you're also able to look back for three years in order to um, increase millage. The other thing that you are also allowed to do that we believe the county, uh, we'd recommend the county consider doing this as well. And that is, and this is only for one year, but you are allowed to also look back. And if you had a, a deficit in the last year that has been, that the audit has been completed, which would be the year we're just wrapping up the 2020 fiscal year, you are also allowed upon a two thirds vote of council to increase millage to recapture that deficit that you had in the prior year. So let's talk for just a minute about what that actually looks like. So the millage increase, when we go back to the three previous years and add those three years up, that percentage is 6.38%. The current year increase would be 1.23%. So in total, we would be looking at 7.61% that we could raise millage. In addition, the deficit from the fiscal year 2020 that we have draft financial statements for, and we'll be coming back to talk to you more in June, is $541,816. So those two things together are what we're recommending that council increase your operating millage for. So right now, here is what your millage breakdown looks like currently. Um, you can see that table over on the right. The most recent value of a mill um, that I obtained from the county auditor was $90,295. And so if we take those percentages, we take the value of a mill and your assessed values, all this information was obtained from the county auditor. Here's what it would actually look like. The 7.61% increase would be approximately 8.75 mills for general fund, 0.8 mills for the hospital and 1.2 mills for rural fire. And the recapture of the deficit would of the $541,816 would be about a six mil increase for general fund. So here's what the impact of these two pieces would be. And I just selected the $100,000 home. Obviously there's, you can look at it at different levels, but the 7.61% increase would be $43.20 a cent increase in property taxes on a $100,000 home. And that's at the 4% level. If it's the 6% level, it'd be 6480. Um, and then if you look at the recapture of that deficit, the $541,000 in the six mills, that would be 24,000, I mean, $24 and 14 cents at 4% on the $100,000 home and $36 and 21 cents at the 6%. So let me show it to you just by fiscal year because I think now you can see what the overall impact would be. So for the 2021-22 fiscal year, you'd be looking at 4% for a $100,000 home. It would be $67.34. And at 6%, it would be $101. For the next year, for 2022-23, 
the numbers are going to fall back because remember the six mils for recapturing the deficit is only for one year. We don't get to keep doing that. That's just making up for that year we had the deficit. So for 22-23, the numbers would go back to the 43.20 and the $64.80 and at the four and 6% levels. So, and, and let me tell you, I, I know, you know, I know, I know these increases are healthy increases, but as it was with the utility rates, what we're really talking about doing is, is four years of an increase and really making up for the fact that it's been a long, long time since we have, have ever increased our, our operating millage rates. So that's bucket one. Um, let me just real briefly then talk about bucket two, um, and that is talking about a public safety fee. Um, as I showed you on an earlier slide, obviously public safety costs are increasing. I think they're, they're going to continue to. Um, I know one of the challenges that we already have at Williamsburg County is the fact that our, our pay um, is really below what some surrounding entities um, are paying and a lot of times we end up training some folks and then they move over somewhere else. So that's one issue that, that needs to get addressed. Um, but those costs continue to increase and generally are increasing at a more significant rate than a lot of our other costs. Um, the, the millage increases that we're talking about, I think would help us, even though it's gonna take some time, um, I think would address us getting heading the right direction on the general operating side. But I don't think that alone is gonna be able to take care of what we really need to be doing on the public safety side. So with the public safety fee, um, there's, there's a lot of different ways you can skin the cat with this. But here is, is what our recommendation is for y'all to consider. And that is adopt, adopting a public safety fee of $40 and having really, you can do either one of these caveats and that is either limiting it to two vehicles per household or um, having no one that is 65 or over actually having to pay the fee. Um, and so we would recommend that you consider one of those two um, just to, to, if you institute this public safety fee to, to make it reasonable for folks. Um, what this is gonna do though, and I, I, I wanna repeat myself because I think this is really important. Operating millage therefore is addressing non-public safety general fund and trying to get things turned around and heading the right direction. Public safety fee allows you to really specifically have these funds going to public safety and addressing the needs that you specifically have in those departments. So um, I know that's a lot. Um, I would be glad to answer any more questions or any, any questions you have. Um, but I also want to make one more recommendation to you. And that is, um, as we discussed with the utility rates, if you remember, one of the things I asked you to consider then was we had a real, we, we instituted a healthy increase and we said, we really don't want to have to have that big of an increase ever again. And so the way to address that is to just do inflationary kind of increases each year just to allow in that case the utility department to keep up with its costs because the costs are going to continue to rise um, i were recommending that uh, you do the same thing when it comes to the millage and to the public safety fee um, and that is to not just make this a one-time thing but to do the small incremental increases each year that allows you to generally keep up with your costs and therefore not get ourselves in the same situation that we find ourselves in right now. Um, that's why 
South Carolina established the law the way it did under Act 388, where it said your operating millage, we're going to combine your CPI inflationary increase. And if you have an increase in population, that as well, put those together. That's what you're allowed. That's how much you're allowed to um, increase your, your taxes on an annual basis. And the, 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 obviously the state did that because they knew the costs were going to go up. And so if you can at least increase your millage by an inflationary kind of factor, that allows you to, to, to hopefully maintain your the financial condition from year to year. Um, so at this point, I will be uh, glad to answer any questions that you have um, or any, anything else that you want to talk about related to this. Uh, yes, Mr. Fake. Uh, good afternoon. How are you? Doing great. Uh, thank uh, you. We thank you so much for what you do for Williamsburg County. Um, you you talked about several things, um, possible things that we could do to help uh, us remedy our situation. Me, excuse me. I'm kind of having a hard time hearing you. Okay, you spoke of several things that we could do to help remedy our situation. I just want to ask, and one of those things we, we you did touch on, um, reduction in services, possibly. My question to you is, do you work with any counties that um, offer, offer, don't offer the amount of services that we offer, a comparable county to ours? Because I think we offer our citizens a lot of, of services, but sometimes it, it makes them feel good to hear maybe. Um, we're doing the best we can with what we have, and sometimes you have to make adjustments, and we just have to understand that we can't go on sometimes to where you're going because eventually you're gonna hit a roadblock. So my question to you, I guess, is, what services do we offer, or do we offer an abundance of other services that um, counties comparable to ours do not offer? Um, great question, and, and probably the thing that stands out to me more than anything else for the population of your county um, is the number of recycling centers, the number of parks that you maintain, help maintain, mm -hmm. the number of uh, fire stations that you have for the population that you have in this county is, is much more extensive than we usually see. Now, one, one thing I do wanna point out, um, whenever we talk about fire stations, and I know y'all know this, but just to, to make sure it's out there, is um, one of the challenges, obviously, if you ever were to start looking at reducing services from a fire standpoint, the impact, often the impact of doing that is even worse on the other side of the coin. And, and that is that you can end up with uh, your ISO ratings increasing for your citizens and therefore the citizens insurance rates are going up. Right. Um, or insurance costs are going up. So that's something you've always got to look on that end of it. But the thing that definitely stands out to me for Williamsburg County is the number of, of facilities that you are operating or maintaining relative to the size of your population. Okay. But thank you. Uh, that's that answered my question. I was just concerned because I've heard some concerns uh, stating that we offer we don't do any better job of offering uh, services than other counties of our size and population, and we are running a deficit. I just wanted to clarify that that we do offer a lot of services, and I don't want to say they, they are necessary services. But I think we have an abundance of some services that we could possibly um, consolidate and make our situation a little better. Thank you. Mm 
any other questions because now is the time to answer them. Um, Mr. Finney, one of the things I, I want us to talk about is um, I know I mentioned to council during a, a budget meeting that we had, uh, one of our budget meetings is that we are trying to hold our own this budget season, um, the current budget season and the next budget season. However, after that, I really don't know what we're, we're gonna, what's gonna happen with us at that point um, because we're barely squeaking through uh, what we can get through now and of course now with all with these increases in not only um, public safety's retirement and insurance retirement plan it, they have also done an increase on the civilians so those are things that are not have not been budgeted in the 2021 and 2022 season right right yes um i i, I will just say from our perspective um when you see what's happening on the cost side of things for the county, I mean, the county is is very quickly going to get in a position where uh, you're not going to end up having any fund balance left. And, and we know last year when when we went to um, to obtain the tax anticipation note again, uh, the bank that we work with actually had some concerns about the financial condition and, and where we're heading. And so if uh, I think it's really important for everybody from the outside, the bond world, you know, which is was what really Brian was talking about, as well as the, the banking world and, and, and other folks, they know we cannot continue as we are. Um, I think it's really even going to be difficult to continue as I don't think you really can continue as you are for the 2122 fiscal year. That's why I wanted to come talk to you now so that we've got time to figure out what we want to do both with the millage and and the, the uh, public safety fee so that we can start to address this now. I, if we do not do anything right now, I'm going to be really, really concerned about what things are going to look like when we get to the end of next year. Thank you. Any other questions? Uh, yes, I, I have one. Uh, Mr. Finney, Sam Floyd, I'm speaking. I don't know if you can see me or not. Hey, Mr. Floyd. Good, good, mor good morning. Good evening. Um, I have a question. Um, I don't know if you recall, but you and I, first time we met was about a year ago up on the second floor of this building. I remember. The, and one of the concerns that you brought to my attention at that time was that Williamsburg County, I think, was out of tier three. We had like nine out of ten of the most employees and employee salaries in regards to um, counties this size. Where do we stack up in comparison to other counties with a population of around 30,000 citizens? In terms of, I understand we have to offer the services, but I'm talking about the extent and size of the services. Are we comparable? Are we top heavy? Or do you have an opinion? Um, actually, I think that the county over the last uh, year to 18 months has done a better job through uh, furloughing some positions, eliminating some positions. Um, cross training um, and so maybe being able to uh, to take a part-time position and kind of move it in with a full-time position and, and still make the workload work. So uh, the last time I looked at comparable counties in the same tier as Williamsburg County, um, when you looked at your population and your uh, total expenses, um, pretty similar, pretty in, pretty in line overall. I don't remember the exact rankings, but certainly not as top heavy as you used to be. And, and, and I will just say, I will credit um, uh, the, the management team and I'm sure council has even been involved in, in, in some of that, but it's, I think it's been a good team effort to move that to, to where it's, it's definitely more reasonable than it used to be. Yes. And for statistics purposes, I did present that to council members, um, in a previous meeting, um, as far as those that are on the general, the, um, 
under the general fund, we went from 283 employees to 230 employees, um, according to the Association of Counties. Um, our part-time went from 141 part-time to 48. So we have made a significant drop in employees. And right about now, I believe we are number four with all of our population group to include all of those who are within the um, that range and those sections and I, you should still have a, a copy of it if not I will get you all another copy of it but it includes like Marion County Marlboro County um, and and other counties but I you know I can get that information back out to you because it was presented to you all during a previous meeting And I, and I will confirm that the last I remember, the last thing I looked at was Williamsburg had, had moved down to number four um, on the list as well. So, mm -hmm. uh, so, you, so the county's made some good progress in that area, Mr. Floyd. And thank you, Dr. Wright and uh, Mr. Finney for your response. I think it's important that the citizens hear that because I know a number of citizens will be listening in on this meeting when we start talking about increasing taxes and spending and so I think it's very important that everyone hears that we are striving to make progress in that direction so that we don't have to increase taxes but nevertheless we'll look at it and see where we are. Uh, any other questions from members of council? No, I, have a, I, have, I have a brief good question. Uh, just for clarification or just to repeat it for persons that are listening in, I, this is uh, Councilwoman Sue Ham. Thank you, Mr. Finney, for the presentation. Um, my question is, if you could reiterate, when was the last time there was a tax increase? What year was that? 2006, 2007 is my understanding. Thank you very much. Mm -hmm. okay. And my comment that I was about to make, uh, Mr. Finney, Based upon what we've discussed, what you've discussed with us to, this, this, this afternoon, population decrease and inflation has contributed greatly to the situation that we are in now. Is that correct? Yes, that, that combined with the, the tax revenue not keeping up with the costs. Right. Okay. And, and, and let me just kind of clear, let me just kind of clarify that. So there there are some counties in south carolina um, that i'm familiar with that have also not raised taxes for a number of years but they are in counties where there has been significant growth in the assessed values such that the property taxes have continued to increase um, so the millage has not had to increase um, Williamsburg County does not fight is not one of those counties obviously the, the there has not been that growth so that's what makes it more difficult for a county that is not experiencing growth to not increase tax millage at least to keep up with the the increase in cost because of inflation so it's a combination I think of uh, not seeing the growth and instead population going the other way. Um, inflation, just that's gonna happen every year and not increasing the operating millage to keep up with inflation. That's, what, that's what's brought us to this point. So Mr. Finney, over the next, um, I should say really a few weeks, I'll be working with council members to um, address these concerns and we would like um, at some point to have you in again uh, once we all come up with some solutions um, and again as you stated too that this is something that we cannot sit on and that we have to address now um, because going into the next fiscal year may not be um, <laughs> may not be as we projected it to be either so I, I think that you know once we talk with them and get their ideas as to how they feel we need to go forward, whether it's the reduction of um, services or uh, whatever the case is, I, th I think at that point we can come back to you and help scrub out the numbers to see what this actually looks like on paper. 
I would love to do that. And hopefully when we do it next time, we'll all, I'll have gas up here again and I can get down there and see you in person. That's right. Any other questions before he signs off? Okay, hearing none. Again, thank you, Mr. Finney. We appreciate you. Thank you, everybody, very much. Have a great rest of the day. You too. All right. Um, I would like to have a motion for recess um, for a moment, just so I can make sure we're queued up for any other the next set of discussions. Um, can we get? Can I get a motion from council so for moves. recess? So move, Supervisor. All right. Um, any discussion? Hearing none. All those in favor of a short recess, please signify by raising your hand. Opposers, the same. We are going to go into recess for about five minutes. Thank you. Hello, yes, I'm here. Okay, no, I didn't. Hello, yes, I'm here. Oh, sorry for the echo. I had the uh, the video of the... Uh, <laughs>
Ready? Thank you. Um, we need a motion to return to regular finance committee meeting. A motion to come out of the executive session. Actually. It wasn't executive session, just motion to come, or, yeah. Okay. Return from recess. We need a second. Second. Any discussion? Hearing none, all those in favor, please signify by raising your hand. Posers the same. We are now back in the regular finance and budget committee meeting. I've asked the fire chief to yield until we get to a portion of the budget that um, he will have to, he would like to address council about. So right now we're gonna go into, go to Winsburg County EMS. Ms. Judy McCray, our director. <coughs> Good afternoon, everybody. Good afternoon. Normally, I come to you guys with write-offs that have been requested. And uh, I actually don't have any this time, but I do have some information. When I met with you guys the last time, we discussed um, whether or not this is something we need to bring before county council or if it's something that we can handle differently or in how other services do it. So I did some investigating. I spoke with three different counties that use three different billing services to see how they handle requests. And all three of them, uh, all, basically all told me the same thing. What they do is they let the billing service handle it totally. They don't have anyone come before them or uh, approach the uh, attorney county, which would be Mr. Bailey Jenkinson, um, for the write-offs. They handle everything in-house, which is what they're paid to do, basically. Um, I also called our billing service to see how they handle it with other counties that I'm not familiar with or that I didn't speak to. And what I was told by Mr. Jeff Sarkos was that they generally do, they have only two or three or a few counties that they handle billing such as us, which is where we come to you guys um, and also Attorney Jenkinson for approval for any write-offs. And they gave me a list of, or several things that on how they handle the billing, which is, of course, they send the billing out. Of, I think it's for a year. And if they don't get any response or any payments, then they will try to attach their state checks for garnishment. Um, when they do send the billing out, there is a questionnaire or a place on the back. If they have anyone that has any disputes, they're welcome to fill it out. They're supposed to send it back in for it to be addressed. And what they do is they address it themselves there. And if they feel like it's something that should be written off, then they send it to the appropriate person at the county, which in our case would be my office. And then we or County Council would approve that one if needed. Other than that, they handle everything in-house. They also have a, a stipulation that if someone that goes to the hospital is indigent, they can get the form filled out from the hospital. They send that form in and theirs is written off automatically. So there's never any question on that. With billing, they have a set fee. If um, you can pay 25 a month, I think is what they told us. That's what they told me is the set fee. If for some reason that person can't pay 25 and they pay just five, they accept that, they put it on their balance, and they will just continue to get a statement each month like you would a regular bill. And that's what they said that um, the majority of all their businesses that they do does it this way. They can completely handle it. They keep county council out of it unless the county itself requests that and wants to do it. My recommendation would be to allow Low Country Billing to, con to do this for us. We're already paying them for this service. They are capable of doing this service. And from everything I spoke with the other counties, and one of them does have our same billing company, and they said they do a great job of it. They never have to handle any of that situations because they handle it for them. So I just wanted to give you guys that information. Do y'all have any questions that I might can answer? Thank you. Appreciate it. Uh, next, we have, as I told you before, we asked for rule fire just to yield just for a moment till we get into budget review revisions um, for third reading. Um, we have in our on Zoom right now, Mr. Rick Campana with um, LCACEM, and we also have our energy specialist um, here. Oh, he's our energy specialist. We also have Mr. Um, Samuel Gadabek, who, and his team with green light bulb, um, green lighting here in the building. So I think what happened uh, a while ago 
we had last year we had uh, invited them to discuss a uh, pr um, an idea that they had in helping us reduce our energy uh, costs and expenses after they had done a audit um, they noticed that we were really uh, spending a great deal of money in the energy business um, electricity etc um, so they had a solution um, that would help the county to uh, be able to afford and afford our electric bills and have cost savings and become more efficient um, we went to council meeting uh, approved it came before the final board and or the final council board and it was again approved however what ended up happening was uh, we ended up getting paperwork in from uh, mr Campan campana's uh, office basically with a um, for us to sign off on a loan so at that point I'm like well hold on let me find out what's going on so we've asked him to come in and just give us some clarity on a little bit more of the process so um, I don't know I think I'll, I'll get mr. Rick to talk about his part first and then you all will have the opportunity to kind of fill in wherever it's necessary but it's just all this meeting is not um, to put anyone on the spot is simply for clarity because I know me anytime I got to sign a document that says loan um, I got to hold on and wait for my council to approve that that in a resolution for me to sign for it all right so we'll go ahead with you mr. Rick thank you all right thanks for the uh, introduction can y'all hear me all right y yes Okay, uh, so my name is Rick Campana. Uh, I'm an energy specialist and I work for the South Carolina Energy Office. Uh, we're a division of the South Carolina Office of Regulatory Staff. Um, so uh, the background on this, so uh, we received a loan application uh, back in the end of January, I believe it came in January 29th. Um, and it came directly from the folks at Green Bulb Lighting. Um, so the loan program is our concert fund loan, and it's a loan we offer to uh, state uh, entities and nonprofits in South Carolina. Uh, and it's designed to help provide funding for projects in the areas of energy efficiency, uh, renewable energy and clean transportation. Uh, so a lighting retrofit project such as this is certainly uh, an applicable uh, project for, uh, for the loan program. Um, so as I mentioned, they, that was submitted in late January um, because of, you know, the, how the program works, you know, we're engaging in a, we would be engaging in an agreement directly with uh, Williamsburg County. Uh, before we proceeded, I wanted to confirm that you were aware of the application uh, and that you wanted us to continue with, with our review process, which includes both uh, a technical review of the actual project uh, that you're applying for, as well as our finance uh, group, they look at the financials uh, of the of the county just to ensure that uh, you know we feel comfortable that you can pay the loan back. Um, so after I uh, corresponded with with you, you confirmed that you wanted us to review it. Uh, so we did that, and um, you know we're simply really just reviewing what's provided to us. Um, so based on that. Uh, the loan application was for two hundred ninety-one thousand dollars, or excuse me, two hundred ninety-one thousand two forty-one dollars, uh, and that includes tax. Um, is to do lighting retrofits at six facilities. Um, based on our analysis of the project, uh, we calculated annual savings of just a little bit under thirty-seven thousand uh, dollars, with a payback period of about seven point eight eight years. Um, which does fall in uh, with the constraints of our program. Um, and our finance team also reviewed the financials that were provided, uh, and I believe there were no issues on that front. Um, so if you want to proceed with this loan application, uh, the next step is we have to have any, any loan applications we want to uh, issue an agreement for, uh, we have to present to a third party body called the Energy Advisory Council. Uh, we have scheduled the next meeting with them for Tuesday, uh, May 25th. Um, so if you wish to proceed, we, we can present it at that meeting uh, and they would have to give an approval or deny. I would expect they would approve it because I don't see any uh, glaring issues with, with the application. Um, 
And uh, if you were to do that, then we would proceed with issuing an agreement. Uh, the loan term would be for 10 years. Uh, you would see the, I think we already provided with uh, you with a payment schedule and, and what that would look like. Uh, the payments would begin one year after completion of the project. Um, and, uh, you know, it is the, the funds for this loan program, uh, they come from the U.S. Department of Energy. Uh, it's part of a, uh, an annual, or excuse me, a three-year grant program, uh, which is where most of our funding comes from. Um, so, you know, it's federal money and it's, you know, there are hoops, you know, you have to jump through in dealing with that. But um, so, you know, it's something to be aware of before engaging with, with the program. But um, that's essentially where we're at with it. So happy to address any questions you might have. I have, excuse me, a good, good afternoon. Uh, thank you for being here with us today. I have just one one question, and, and I shall be brief. Um, what counties are you currently located in, um, and you're doing type the same type thing that you're anticipating doing for us? Well, to be clear, so um, we we represent the entire state. Our office is located in Columbia. Uh, but we work with uh, state entities all over the state. You know, currently we have some uh, projects going on with um, Florence districts uh, two and five, I believe. Uh, we also have, um, trying to think as far as other school districts, uh, I think Lawrence 56 is another we're working with right now. Um, and so to be clear, you know, uh, I represent the state um, I work for the state. This is a state loan program, but we are separate from, entirely separate from Greenbold Lighting that has proposed this project to you. Um, we can't, uh, we, you know, we can't certify the work of any third party contractor. Uh, we don't, it's not our responsibility to manage the project. That would be Williamsburg County's uh, responsibility. Um, you know, when we issue a loan agreement, it's with the county or what, whoever is applying for the loan. Um, so our agreement would be with you and you're ultimately responsible for managing any third parties that are involved. So any uh, contractors or vendors or whoever you're working with to get the project done. Okay, you, you said you are currently in Lawrence County now? Uh, well, no, I'm, I'm located in Columbia. That's where our office is, the Office of Regulatory Staff. Uh, which houses the energy office. Uh, Lawrence is just one of the projects we're, we're doing right now, one of the other loans we have right now. Uh, I just thought you might like some examples of, of uh, who else we're working with at this time. Okay. So probably best if um, Greenlight addressed that issue. Well, so I'm, you can kind of start I'm, over. I'm, I'm trying to figure out your question because, Rick, mm -hmm. how many counties have you worked with in the past? Ooh, uh, offhand, I don't. I'm, I couldn't even say. Uh, I've been with the energy office for two years. Uh, we've done probably between about five to ten loan agreements in that time. Um, in addition to the ones I mentioned offhand, uh, Marion County and City of Marion. Um, we've also worked with uh, Newberry College, um, and then we've had other projects that were outstanding that have since completed uh richland school district one uh hampton school district one saluda school district uh we also have a grant program that we have and we uh, do about seven projects uh per year through that program so this year we've been working with uh richland school district two uh york school district one lee school district uh college of charleston clemson university um there's a couple other I'm blanking on offhand. Oh, Benedict College. Um, so I mean, we again, we we work with all uh, state entities uh, within these pr programs uh, with our both our loan and grant program. It's open to all state entities. So any school districts, local governments, state agencies, uh, public colleges and universities, and then also nonprofits as well. Hi, Rick. Councilwoman Sue Ham, I have a question for you. I wanted to sure. um, ensure I understood the information you presented. From my understanding, the loan would be for $291,242, uh, which will, 
I guess, install new lighting at six facilities that will net a $37,000 savings annually. Is that correct? Yeah, based on our analysis, that, okay. that is what we determined. And um, like I said, we, we're just taking the information that's provided to us. Um, so uh, the contractor that you're working with had uh, provided us with their proposal. Uh, we looked at uh, what the existing lighting system that um, they were saying is existing uh, and then did an analysis of what they were uh, saying that they're going to replace those existing lights with uh, and that's to calculate and then we also use uh, hours of operation that are provided to us and that's all to calculate the annual kilowatt hour savings, uh, the annual energy savings. Uh, and then we took your utility rates that you're on to get an estimate on the what resulting dollar savings would be from that. Okay, so based on the analysis, uh, we would have a savings of 37000 annually. The loan would be for a period of 10 years. So that's approximately $29,000, $124 that we would pay back each year. Is that correct? Uh, let me see. For the um, payment schedule. Yeah, here. And I can provide you all a copy of it. They had issued out books um, and I apologize, I know everyone gets tired of hearing this, but I'm the new kid on the block, so um, I wasn't privy to all that information. And, and plus, I'd like to clear it up for anybody that's on Facebook who's watching so that they can understand. But it appears to me, uh, so to, to frame this up here, it appears to me that we'll be getting into a loan that we'd have to pay back for 10 years. We would definitely save $37,000 a year, which would take care of the payments for the loan for those 10 years. After those 10 years have expired, we would still take on those savings of $37,000 a year. Is that correct? That is correct. And, and Councilwoman Ham, what we did is we came in, we did a detailed audit of those six buildings. We had to take a look at every single, inf I mean, your existing lighting infrastructure, then we had to make a proposal as to what we would put back in. And what we're putting back in has a 10-year warranty, which means that we're putting it in. If anything happens to it, it's replaced within those 10 years. So you don't have any issues there. Um, once that was done, we came back, we presented that. The board decided to, to move forward with it. I think we actually, um, once they move forward with it, the application is then completed. We then send that to Rick because we have to include our information as well in there. And then Rick and those go through it and they double check, one, what we propose, what's existing, what we propose, what our savings calculations are. So they pretty much have to mesh just to ensure that this is accurate. Mm -hmm. and, um, and, then we, and then they contact you to notify you we've done that, everything seems to be in, in line, are you interested in moving forward? Thank you. Yeah. Um, and one thing I wanted to add, I, I, I believe I neglected to mention um, when I did my little intro, uh, the interest rate on the loan is 1.5%. Uh, so the uh, total payments will uh, total out to 315805 and 90 cents. So the annual payment is 31580 and 59 cents. And so with uh, annual savings estimated at uh, just under $37,000, it'll be almost $6,000 uh, difference. Any questions from either the regulatory agency or our vendor? So next council meeting, we'll be ready for the resolution for the signing of the contract. All right, Mr. Rick, as soon as the resolution is complete, we'll go ahead and sign off on the contract. Thank you, Thank you all. Thank you. I, um, I have a couple upstairs, and I'll, I'll get them to them. I'll make copies of them. And I'm sorry I couldn't be there in person to, uh, to show everything to y'all, but uh, a little difficult at this time with uh, everything we have going on, so. That's right. All right. Thank you, Rick. I appreciate it. And you can get, if you can, I don't know if you need to refresh the application or just send it over to us so we can get it to the attorney and then he can draw the resolution up. Uh, no, I think if, if um, you just want to, um, you know, email me confirming that you wish to move forward, um, we can include it then in the, in the next EAC meeting that's going to happen in two weeks. Okay. Yeah. And then from there, uh, provided we get approval, 
uh, we'll uh, have a agreement package routed throughout our agency. So it's reviewed by basically all the groups in our agency, our legal team reviews it, uh, the energy office reviews it, it's reviewed by our finance department and so on, all the way up to our executive director. Uh, it would then be uh, sent out to you for your uh, signature uh, and then returned to us for our executive director signature, at which point it would become fully executed. Okay, so counsel is okay with me sending him an email saying, let's go forward. All right. Yes. All right, I'll get that email to you as soon as we clear the meeting. Okay, sounds good. And if there's any questions, you know, after the fact, uh, feel free to reach out to me. Thank you. Absolutely. I think that's it. All right, our next order of business. Next order of business is the budget review and revision for second for third reading. As we sit and wait, um, as you know, we had was able to get a balanced budget over the period, I mean, prior to first reading. However, um, when it was discovered, and Liz will get more into it, um, there were some other issues that we needed to clean up that additional requests had been made. So um, in an effort to figure out how to pay for them, um, we're presenting that information to you all now. Oh, so everybody get a packet. Everybody get a packet. All right. You're on this. You have an extra one. I'd like to have one. <laughs> no, it's balanced. It is balanced. However, you also had, we had some other requests that were made. We received additional funding from the Senate and the, re the House. So we wanted to talk to you all about how those funds, um, yeah, needed to be, right. Mm -hmm. And then we also wanted to um, talk to you all about the issue with fleet management that we had during the last meeting. I, I was really tripping, I thought we had a you do. Uh -huh. He's like, what just happened? No, we're good. We just got to tell you what's going on. All right. All right. Good afternoon, Council. Um, we just have some changes for the budget for third reading. And I have provided a list of the handouts for you. Um, the handouts that have asterisks donated next to it, those are for information purposes only. Um, the Act 388 um, rollback um, handout it shows you, if you look at that handout, how um, Larry came up with the 6.38 millage that is in the millage bank that the state has allowed us to use, and we have not used any of the millage. So this is just an example of what it looks like, and there is support and documentation behind it, just in case you want to go and look at the support and documentation and compare it to the millage roadback summary. You also have the South Carolina um, Code of Law section 61-320, which talks about the millage rate increase limitations and exceptions on what, how we can increase millage if we need to. This is just for information purposes only. You have the millage, um, rate limitation for next fiscal year. Um, 
you also have the previous year so that you can go back and look and see how the millage rate caps were calculated for those previous years, which is a part of the three-year millage bank summary. Um, rule fire, um, you have that proposed operating budget with reclassified personnel and safer grant. Um, we were requested by council to provide this information, so we are providing it to you today. We have financing, financing of the three ambulances for EMS. Um, we're going to talk about restore inactive positions for the sheriff office. Um, there are also the budget revisions, which is item number 11. We will we'll talk about the state aid to local government increase, the school resource officer grant through the South Carolina Department of Education, increase in retirement rates, increase in our state health plan, and also the enterprise fleet lease. We, um, Dr. Wright will have an update on the Chavis One Stop Project uh, if she has any additional information. And item number 13 through 16 is just updated additional funding requests by um, received from county departments. So we updated those requests. We removed one of the capital requests for the cameras over in the um, Alex Chapman office because we set aside some funds that we received through the CARES Act to take care of that immediate concern because that is immediate concern because they the cameras are not working right at this time. So we use we're using some of the funds which is not very left uh, much left in that um, fund account. Um, so the asterisk is for information purposes only. Let's go and talk about the rural fire uh, proposed operating budget with the reclassified personnel and safer grant. Dr. Wright, I'm going to give you the opportunity to go ahead and address that um, budget revision or proposed budget revision because you've been working very close with the fire chief. So I'll just jump in whenever necessary. I'm going to um, yield the space for the fire chief at this time, as well as, I believe, one of his board members. Okay. Again, this is information that was requested um, by council members in, in regard to the direction of where our fire department is going. So I am ain't waiting on him. EMS. Okay, no problem. We received a quote from a vendor that is on state contract. Mm -hmm. And earlier, Brian mentioned that there is some um, available funding balance in our debt service account to service additional um, capital needs. Um, in our budget that was passed for the first and second reading, I estimated a, an amount of 270000 which is about 15000 more than Brian Nurek numbers. But there is enough to um, pay for these three ambulances in our debt service budget. So if you look at the requests from BB and T, which is on state contract, um, I pulled a amortization schedule, and based upon the amortization schedule, it, the payments will be seventy-three thousand one hundred and sixty-three dollars and sixty-two cents. Um, we have enough in our debt debt service um, fund balance to take care of that request and we can take it off of our capital request list. So I want to share that information with you today. The budget revisions for the third reading. You have that list and it has it has the page number description 
where the budget amount was at first and second reading and where it is going to for third reading and the difference in each one of those budgets. The state aid to local government has been increased um, by $111,069. We want to thank our Senator and House of Representatives for supporting the increase in our state aid to local government because every little bit helps when you are trying to balance a budget. And we hope that one day that the state will um, give us our full funding level. But in the meantime, we will accept any increases that they give us. This year, they increased the budget by $111,069. Um, the House version The House recommended an increase of of $109,229,000. The Senate increased, increased it by $1,840, which gives us a total increase in local government of $111,069. How did we spend that increase? What we did is there is um, county revenue and uh, retirement. We were hoping that they would delay the increase in county retirement, police retirement, and our health insurance uh, until next budget year. We just received those numbers. So for um, the county retirement, we applied $1,165.61. Um, police retirement, we applied $5,505.67. And health insurance, we applied $4,634.78. Let me also note that the health insurance increase is only half year because that increase does not start until January of next year. So in next budget season, you need to budget the full amount of the increase. I just want to make note of that. So that helped us out this year. Um, also, contractual services. We increased contractual services for I, uh, our IT department so we can honor the new IT agreements for the technology that we, the improved technology that we have. So $91,762 went to IT. If you add up all those figures um, from the 9,000 down to the 91,000, it will come back to our increase that we received for state aid. Also, a part of this request is the school resource officers I, um, that from the state. I just got this information from the sheriff last week, and they will plan to renew that um, grant through the South Carolina Department of Education. As you see, I already had some monies in the budget for that. I was just waiting for confirmation um, from the sheriff. So based upon that, we, add, we needed another $69,770.30, which allowed us to uh, apply the difference to our fleet enterprise leasing. And as you can see, we took and we gave the sheriff to help him out in his enterprise fleet lease agreement, $5,506.50. And then we applied the remaining balance to other um, departments in the general fund to help us meet our um, lease agreement with fleet enterprise. However, we're still lacking 144000 $560.94. So during the course of the year, the budget is balanced. We have taken all of these extra revenues and we have applied them to the budget. But during the course of the fiscal year, before it's over, we have to identify $144,000. $560.94 to meet our enterprise fleet lease agreement. 
I think we have come a long way because when we found out about the agreement, we were we were looking at a figure of $494,031.12. So we have gotten it from 494000 down to needing only $244,560. It's on the second page of your um, sheet. Do you have any questions about the revisions for third reading in your packages you have all support and documentations to um, to reflect the revisions that I just shared with you so let me just explain a little bit about the fleet um, so she gave you us the numbers and we all knew that this was going to be a, a concern thought it was going to be a huge concern and thankfully we was able to fix it however initially when the agreement was developed for the fleet management um, uh, ideal is what happened was they took a trend of about maybe I think it's about five years of what we would spend in maintenance costs for the, all of the vehicles and they came up with this amount um, that um, if the county were to go with us we would use what they would spend or anticipate it would be anticipated to spend on maintenance and purchases of new cars outright, and we will apply that to this fleet management concept. Um, so essentially, we would save you on maintenance costs because new vehicles means less maintenance costs. However, um, I don't know for sure where they got all that from because it does not show that we actually spent this much in fleet bills. Now, this is the largest of the fleet management bill that we have throughout this entire process, and I believe it's over a 10-year period to where we were supposed to see a significant cost savings. Um, but again, when you're doing forecasts and projections, they're not always accurate. This time, it just so happened to be um, Way a little off. bit off. Way off. Oh, okay, I, I, yeah, I tried. <laughs> it, it was way off. It was basically $400,000 off when we started about <laughs> Exactly. Now, we didn't know we owed. Right, exactly. We were being balanced, there was $400,000 debt out there that we weren't working with that now we have to tend to. Right. And we recovered a substantial portion of that, that mm -hmm. from mm -hmm. the state. Mm -hmm. Put towards it, but we mm -hmm. still have 144 left to go. Yes. Right. Yeah. So I yes. Yes. So what we're going to do is there are still vehicles out there, and it, it just apparently it didn't work as they it was planned to work mm -hmm. because apparently once you finish with a vehicle, you're supposed to send it. It's supposed to be auctioned, and you're supposed to get you know a, a relative amount of money back. However, what they didn't tell us is the kind of vehicles you chose or that you're using does not get a, a good does not yield a good resale value on it so that's kind of where we are so instead of maybe okay. something we thought we were going to get you know maybe maybe 15 or six, sixteen thousand back now that trying to kind of drop this down to like three or four thousand dollars and if it was non-public safety vehicles maybe the proposal would have worked and what caught Dr. Wright and mm -hmm. I, um, we asked the question because they wanted to trade, they wanted to trade in one of mm -hmm. some of our public safety vehicles. And we went back and we looked at what we were expecting to receive mm -hmm. compared to what they wanted to give us. And we were like, oh no, mm -hmm. w let's go back and look at this scan because this is what you told us we were supposed to get, but now you're not. So I asked the question, what happened? They said, because they are specialized vehicles mm -hmm. that they can't get as much for them on the market as a non-specialized vehicle, which was probably not considered mm -hmm. in that 10-year savings. Plan. Right. When, so, did, oh, when, did, when did we enter this and when is our 10 years up? Uh, we entered into this in 2017. Mm -hmm. Um, and you know, ten years is not up to some some twenty 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 seven right. Liz, could, the, could that debt services money be applied towards this debt? Um, it is a lease. Um, it is a operating lease. Mm -hmm. Now I will have to check the new the Gatsby laws 
to see if it was a capital lease, yes, Councilman, but it's not a capital lease. Mm -hmm. It's a operating lease. Mm -hmm. So I will have to check the most recent Gatsby laws and see if we can um, use uh, the debt service millage to um, pay for this operating lease. It's not a capital lease. So I will get back with you. Um, that is a explorable option but I think we ought to wait until we get all the vehicles we're, we're decided that we were not going to go through enterprise to do the trade-ins we were going to try to sell these things back in the open market by a third party which should yield us a little bit more money so I think we ought to wait until before we start taking out any other debt um, and we need yeah. to wait and see how much you're going to get back on this and then we'll revisit it and and has that's right yeah we mm -hmm. will look into that but also has dr Wright and i we discuss with the council that maybe we should um, buy non-public safety vehicles to help us out mm -hmm. with this contract um, we should only use enterprise for non-safety um, in public safety vehicles because they will exchange them out mm -hmm. and because the vehicles have high mileage because of the wear and tear and the distance these vehicles have need to travel so keep fleet enterprise for public safety vehicles and for non-public safety vehicles like for maybe Those road bridges. and bridges or anyone else let's use our cap five-year capital improvement plan and say and keep money in debt service and our debt service fund to buy those vehicles mm -hmm. so we have a solution after so, this we so, just need to get this taken care of yeah so those are some those are some of the options and these are the budget revisions that will be reflected in the budget for the third reading and you will see that we will have to go back in every one of these general fund departments and we will have to show the revisions but these are just total vision uh, revisions for all departments do we have any questions for this part we still got part two which will be the uh -huh. fire department's presentation yes thank you, thank you all right all right Randy you're on chief Swinton and Good afternoon. Hello. Um, we're still doing a little bit of stuff with finance with uh, Ms. Liz and on, on the finance. So I won't bring that before you, but I just want to run something through you right now and just make you aware of where we at. For those of you who don't know. Uh, Hold on. No, you need to go ahead and talk about the financial piece because they asked for the cost of personnel for safer grant. Um, the safer grant, I don't know exactly what they pay starts, but I'm pretty sure it's more than what we pay because the last safer grant that I brought the last six employee on it was about fifteen hundred dollar more than what we were paying so safer grant has a a base rate of what they're going to pay and after that we have to maintain that salary from that point um, do we have it <laughs> no by a long shot we don't have it um, we, as you know we special purpose tax what I get is what we get. Um, so are we on the budget? Yes, sir, 1985. That's the budget I'm working off of. It's supposed to have been 10, eight or 10 stations. We have 23. 23. Have the citizens seen a savings for that 23? They have. Everybody that has a fire hydrant and a fire station within five miles of their residence, the insurance company rec recognize ISO rating, their rating is a four. Not every insurance company out there recognize ISO rating because of the cheap price they have to give the customers. That's on them, I, I don't control that. I just go with ISO rating give me. The county itself is a four slash four wide, which is a four slash four eight. We're not a 10, we are an eight. Do they see a savings because they don't have a hydrant? Yes, because they are an eight versus a 10. But if we don't do something soon, we're going to lose this ISO rating. Volunteers do what they can for us. 
you can go and check any neighboring county and everybody is suffering the same way. Mm -hmm. Everybody's hauling for help for fire service. I start to bring in a set of gear, gear and an air pack mm -hmm. just for you all to feel the weight. My average age firefighter right now is 30 and up. Our volunteer, an average age volunteer, not only in Williamsburg County, is 40 years and up. Young people is not coming. They're not, we, we all have kids. We got to make them do something. They're not going to get up off the chair and volunteer like we did when I first joined the fire department in 1991. I have 800 square miles or a little more to cover with 10 paid employees. Rondell and myself make 12 to cover, depending on my volunteers. They're there. They're there, and I'm not going to be up here long making a long speech. They're there when they can be, when they're not working. If you're working a 12-hour shift job, start at 6, you can't get out your bed at 3 o'clock and come help me fight a house fire at 3 and work 12 hours. Mm -hmm. No, I'm calling my neighboring county trying to get assistance. We don't receive automatic aid in Williamsburg County. The city of Kingston receive automatic aid. City of Hemingway receive automatic aid. Because in order to receive automatic aid and ISO to recognize that, I got to be protected 100%. The whole circle must have automatic aid. We don't have that. 10 firefighters, 10. The city of King Street have seven. I think they were like five, six miles. They covered totally helped me with 15. We have 800 with 10. Georgetown neighboring county have 48 with the EMS and fire. Clarendon County has 36 firefighters. But yet, I understand we reduce reducing in population, but we still have citizens out there that depends on the fire department. Your house ain't no better than their house. I got to get a fire truck there. Two o'clock in the morning to go to a fire alarm. Ladies and gentlemen, I don't, when I come back from a two o'clock fire, there's no shift for me to leave and go home. My guys go and shower up and come back to work. Mm -hmm. We don't have a shift coming in. There is no shift to release us. We're there. We have to do something toward the fire department. We can increase a few dollars, and I'm not saying I'm not asking that because we're still working on that. Or we can cost them a few hundred dollars because if ISO rating goes up, that's just what the citizen will pay on their insurance. Then the phone calls will start. Well, Chief, what happened? So I'm making you aware of this before it happened. If their ISO rating go up and they're paying $600 a year, and that next year the ISO rating go up and they get a bill for 1000 guess who they're calling? We need some help on Williamsburg County Fire Department full time, guys. We're going to have to do something. We're working on it, trying to work the best we can. I just want you to know it's not an easy job. Folks, oh, what, what they do, what they do. Last year, we had 97 structural fire in Waynesburg County, 97 house fire of some kind. 465 accidents that we responded to. 632 woods fire. It's not easy. It's not easy. The average one of us that works right now in the fire service is unhealthy because we don't get that six hour sleep. It's always interrupted every night because I don't have a shift coming in that morning. I don't, but it's time for us to, to, to do something, 1985 to now, 2021. 20, Ten full-time firefighters. South Lynchers have six. They hear he has no way near ours and plan to hire more. Look what we at. And I understand we're going to say, we're going to say, 
we can't do it, but the citizen don't want to hear that when that fire truck don't show up at the house. The only thing they want to hear is, where were you? Where were you? I'm just asking. I don't have the numbers for you all, the figures mm -hmm. to sit down and discuss with you all right now, and I apologize for that. We are prepared. Ms. Liz? Okay, if you look in your package, let us review. How many um, fire personnel is he requesting? Um, Safer grant allows us the opportunity for the first year, a percentage, I believe, is it 75%? Yes, it's 75% the first year and the second year. And the third year of the Safer grant, they will pay 35%. And after that, it's 100%. And if they look at their... they will see for each year the operating deficit and what that operating deficit is equivalent to as far as mills is down below. Mm -hmm. For fiscal, for the next fiscal year, we're looking at an operating deficit of $225,865. That's the equivalent of 2.35 mils and so on all until the last year of the SAFER grant, which if approved will be um, fiscal year 25-26. That means that we're looking at an operating deficit of $564,870.06. That is equivalent to 5.9 mils. Um, only thing I can say is that we've been addressing this issue um, about the need for an increase in rural fire millage for many years. Um, is that the point now is what do we do? I mean, do we sacrifice the safety of our citizens and also the safety and the well-being of our firefighters because we don't have a rotating shift. So when they're out early, I mean, when they're out late fighting fires, then that, that same shift have to return back to work the next day. That is not safe either. So you can take this list and you can examine it. And we try to keep some of the costs consistent um, keep in mind, it does not reflect the inflation rates. It's in your notes. The figures do not reflect inflation rates, which is something that we will need to consider. Thank you. Oh, I want to apologize. Uh, I sound like this because I just realized I'm hard of hearing, so I got I have some hearing aids, so I talk loud. It's not that I'm yelling. I, everybody that knows me know I talk loud. <laughs> but I just find out I um, have to get some hearing aids so I can hear. So I apologize if you think I was that just me. I'm just going to <laughs> let you know and let the citizen know that this is the chief. Everybody know me can hear me a mile away because I got to talk loud enough to hear myself talk. But so, um, how many firefighters is that, um, chief? That's a. Uh, I think that was eight. Total additional missing. fire chiefs or additional fire, fire personnel, six. It was six in an officer position, or eight in an officer position. Eight. Eight in an officer position. Um, and that is to get us with a 24-hour um, fire service. Um, two guys out of headquarters, uh, two personnel, I'm sorry, ladies involved as well, and, and one out of Trio and one out of Hemaway. Uh, so when the tone go off, we have a truck going, so we won't have to be getting up uh, to go to a fire alarm. We have somebody to do that. That's, that's the importance of it, is giving, it, it, and I'm afraid if we don't do something, and with my paid staff, is that these guys is going to go to a job that they're going to make some money on. The average factory is paying them 4 to $5 more an hour. Is that firefighting's got to be instilled in you. It's nothing that you're going to come in here and do for money. That is something God bless you with, because I'm going to tell you, and I'm, I'm finished with this, but see, it's a mental issue that we have to deal with. It's not that we've been out there and there this child died and then your neighbor would come out, Randy, where's my baby? Those are things we have to deal with. 
mental issues instead of along with the physical issue nobody knows what the fire department does and then, i mean they think we just ride in the truck but when you go there and there's a child burn up in a house that's a mental status that you have to deal with we have to bring in a council and sit down and talk about it these the, it just it's, it's just a lot of stress for 13 dollars an hour Say it again. Ma'am? You said thirteen dollars an hour? Thirteen. That's where we starting off. Thirteen twenty seven. I mean <laughs> I'm uh, anybody have any questions for me? Chief, you said something that um that sparked my curiosity as far as with volunteers. I have two questions. Um how old do you have to be to volunteer? And if it is over 18, is is there still a pro, is there a program in place where we can inspire uh, youth firefighters? We do have a youth firefighter program. We take in six per class at the most. Um, we brought in six last year, but these kids go into college. Um, <laughs> basically, when you see a, a young kid wanting to volunteer, they got a career ahead of them. We, 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 we the six that we brought in, some of them turn 18 this year. The majority of them is in the college, military, and they're going away. I mean, I have 118 firefighters on that list, on my volunteer list, and the average age on that is 45 to 50 years of age. I'm yep. serious. So a lot of them, uh, one of my volunteer, my fireball members sitting back there. Uh, <laughs> I mean, they drive the trucks for us. They do what they can for us, but they got to go home. That means those equipment have to be take up and put back on those trucks. They got to get put back in service. They, we, we cut yard, we service trucks, we clean the station. That's what those 10 guys do. We try to take that work off the volunteers because he's working 10 to 12 hours. Uh, the 10 a class now, to become a firefighter is 200 hours. 200 hours of 11, uh, I mean our firefighter class to be able to fight firefighters. To drive an engine, is 40 hours plus 20, so it's 60 hours. You got 40 hours of classroom EBT. That's through the state, and that's through our insurance company that we have here. You have to be EBT certified. Then you got to ride with somebody for 20 hours, respond in the engine before you turn loose on that. That's 260 hours. Hazmat another 40 hours. It's not like it used to be. That's why you don't see volunteers. You're gonna put in three or 400 hours before you even start firefighter one. I'm, well, I guess the reason why I'm asking is to just get kids, because you, like you said, most of us don't know what is in the day-to-day -day routine of a firefighter. I, for one, don't know. And hearing your presentation today, I empathize with all the firefighters, because I never even thought about the mental component. So my question is basically relating to the youth, even though they may go off to school, but just inspiring like a younger age to get them enlightened as to what a firefighter goes through. What's the, what's the youngest age group that someone can- 16. 16 years old? But the okay. thing will happen to us, I don't have the money to purchase the gear. The gear is $1,800 for the passing court. That didn't include the helmet, boots, and gloves. The, a pair of boots for the firefighter is $345. Mm -hmm. a, a helmet is 300 and something dollars, and a pair of gloves is $60. Mm -hmm. Then you got a flash hood for another $47. You know, one time we were getting the grant money. We do get grants, but once they see you don't get a certain amount of grant, that gear is obsolete in 10 years. Mm -hmm. Air packs are $6,500, they obsolete in 10 years. So when you got a fire, when you dress out a firefighter, you dressing out eight thousand dollars. When he got on an air pack, helmet, boots, gloves, you looking at eight thousand dollars. That didn't include that fifteen hundred dollar radio on his side or that five hundred dollar pager. Thank God there's grant money for it. The counties we escape a lot of it with grant money, but we still have to purchase gear on and on. One of these trucks that's 22 years old, the pump just went. It was $12,000 to replace that pump. So it costs with a fire department. But we do all this because we swore to protect and serve the citizens of Waynesburg County. So please, I mean, look, all I can do, I pray on it before I came up here. It's God touch your heart and we got to do what's right. So somebody's not going to come out and hand me $20 just because. 
Sometimes we have to whip our child because we love them. Sometimes we got to do what we have to do because we love our brothers and sisters. And that's the only way we can move forward there. Mm-hmm. And I, I, anybody have any more questions for me? Yeah, right now, I have just one question. What kind of recruiting tools do you, do you utilize um, to try to encourage these young children, even in the schools or whatever, to come into their profession? But bef- even before you talk about equipment, we need to have the interest of the young people, particularly based on what you said, because these older people like me and Smurf know we can't fight a fire. So we need to get the interest sparked in these young people. And I was just wondering what kind of uh, a- a- recruitment tools you use. Every equipment tools, I know they, um, the county being all the, the little school, um, somebody help me out here with it's Career Day Social Career Media. Day Center, we there, thank you. Um, we in the churches, we're everywhere we can be, either I'm there, Rondell, Calvin, Somebody's sitting there trying to recruit. We'll get three or four with intent, with intent. But when the parents realize, hey, I can't send you to King Street. You got, that's 200 hours of class you got to take. We get the kids that live in the area that comes up and, and who really want that. But they're 16. They can't really do anything at the age of 16 but mind a little stuff and mm-hmm. get the experience. Mm-hmm. But... When you look at the pay, let's see what it is, and I know the, the finance director discussed this. 19% of your salary, you don't have a say so. It's going in your retirement. Yeah, it's for later on. But that's $140 out of my check I need right now. Mm-hmm. But you in the factory, you bring home that $140. So if I'm making $13.27 an hour and I'm paying 19% of that in retirement without a say-so, my check is reduced Mm -hmm. on top of my insurance. Then I'm risking my life running in, saving somebody I don't know. So basically we're we're really not getting a whole lot of volunteers that's going to come out Not only here, it's every county. I mean, you're welcome to call any county around here, North Carolina, I just been up there looking at a truck. The guy said, I got 29 people on my roster and nine firefighters. Okay. So, Ms. Liz, the solution to this, to hire the additional um, firefighters and the one officer, if I'm understanding this correctly, uh, we need to increase the millage and to cover the 2021 20, 22 to make sure we're not in the deficit, we need to at least collect 225800 and eight hundred dollars and sixty-five cents is that correct? And then each year increase that in order to maintain the salaries of the new personnel we will hire. Yeah, the increase for the first year is just the reclassified personnel, and for the next three years, will the increase will reflect the eight, the nine um, safer grant officers. Like I mentioned earlier, it will be. The um, federal government will reimburse us 75, let me, 75% of their salary for the first and second year. For the third year, it drops down to 35%. And then the fourth year, um, your question was the... We still can't hear you. The number of personnel for the rural fire. The first year reflects. Probably take your mask down. Um, Councilwoman Hammond, the first year for 21 22, that reflects the reclassify salaries for the current Mm. staff and to reclassify them to get them at a competitive salary rate will cost us an additional $225,800. That's equivalent to 2.35 mils. For fiscal year 22-23, that will be the first year of implementing the SAFER grant with the additional eight firefighters and the one new officer.
correct me. Yes, ma'am. And then 2324 will be um, we reduce some of the um, permanent part time because we felt like if you got more new officers, you do not need as many permanent part time or volunteer staff, but you still need some of your volunteer staff to help. We can't, right. we can't get rid of them completely. So for that year, um, we would need 2.7 mils to pick up the deficit. And keep in mind, these other expenses besides salary are, remain stable gotcha. to help keep the budget and work with the budget. So for fiscal year 24-25, that's when we pay 35% or the federal government will pay 35% of those new firefighters that will increase our deficit to $420,143. In 2025-26, we will receive no more funds from the federal government for our new firefighters. We have to fund them at 100%. Okay. And then, Chief, I, I'm sorry. And that's five. If I read this correct, that's an additional 5.9 mils. Um, yes. Almost yes. Six mils. You said it's 5.9. Yes. Um, when we take over 100 percent of the new firefighters, that means the eight new firefighters and the one new officer. Okay. Firefighter officer. Can, yes, what's the difference? They're a firefighter. Basically, he's uh, is in charge of that shift. Thank you. Yes, ma'am. Do we? There, there, there are certain things on the fire department you must be an officer to be to maintain. Thank you for that clarification. Position. And then my final question is to the chief. Uh, if council moves forward with this and we're able to find the funding or we're able to prove this in the millage, um, do you have uh, a pool of people at hand right now to hire from? No, nobody does. <laughs> nobody does. Um, we do have some part-time uh, firefighter that works for us. Um, we have a part-time list, but if the, if the pay it would catch their eye, then they, I'm pretty sure they, they, they love doing it. But, uh, you know, and especially we would turn the shift work, that would allow them to, to work for us, you know. Um, so then is it, is it fair to say that in the first year we would just be uh, bringing up the salaries of our current firefighters, which I'm totally in agreement with. So we wouldn't necessarily accrue or incur all of these deficits right off because we may not be able to hire people right away because unfortunately the pickings are slim. So even though this is a proposed deficit, we may not necessarily go into such a big deficit right off. Is that, is that fair to say? Yes, ma'am. Okay. That's all I have. Any other questions? I have a comment, please. Uh, uh, Chief uh, Swinton, I had the opportunity, uh, unfortunate, to, to see uh, you and your department in action. Uh, uh, one of my neighbor's house burned down within a mile from where I lived, and I remember seeing you, and at that time, well, still, there was no water, and you were just running back and forth trying to get water. But the one thing I saw in there was uh, some grandkids out there, and in that fire, they lost their little cat. And I saw the emotional strain on them. And to hear you say about firemen that goes in the house and see kids and, and other people burn up, I can sense that there's a great deal of uh, emotion that goes on within your department. And I have one question is, uh, are you able to get the resources they need to deal with situation like that? Yes, sir. The, the state has a uh, what we call a fast board. I can call and request. We have um, several folks that I have some of my guys already trained to sit down and um, they, teach, they teach them how to, to uh, counsel. And the state have counsel. We normally use a guy out of Florence who comes down and uh, counsel. He's going to call regardless of when the period of time just to check and make sure everything all right. And, uh, but we, we can say what we want to. I'm not in the military, never been, but I knew what these people go through when you see a friend of yours, your neighbor, someone's child 
body just deteriorated and from an accident and when their family running up to you and they know you and they're calling your name, they're not calling you chief, it's hard. So it's, it's more than just fighting fire. It's a mental strain. The state saw that years ago. That's why they put this fast team together. It's a mental strain. And for $13.27 an hour, you know, I got volunteers to come out. But if they see this, they're not going to come up. They're not going to get involved in that. They're going to bring the truck. They're going to run traffic. So everybody's not, like I said, everybody can dribble a basketball, mm -hmm. but everybody's not a basketball player. Right. And thank you for what you've done. I, know, I understand your passion. I've seen you in the community. And I know you're very passionate about the fire department. And thank you so much for everything you've done for William Burris County. Okay, and before I leave, um, for those of you who haven't heard, Leonard Murphy was my fire board member. Mm -hmm. Sue, he passed last night. Mm -hmm. And um, funeral Saturday. I think that's Miss Carolyn's district. Yeah, I'm sorry, Miss mm -hmm. Carolyn. I'm sorry. Please forgive me, Miss Carolyn. <laughs> Yeah. But I, I knew his wife. I worked with her actually at USDA, so thank you for that. Well, he's been more than enough for us over the years. Yes, mm -hmm. thank you. Thank you. Um, I would be interested uh, to share with you all the differences or disparities in salaries with firemen. I can get that information to you across the board in areas that are similar to ours. So that's usually the question. Um, any other questions regarding this? Um, at the end of this, we got one more presentation, short presentation regarding the Chavis One Stop um, Recreation Project. Um, and then from that point, I will do just a blanket um, request for a motion to go to full council because um, we hadn't done any of that yet. So, um, so in reference to the Chavis One Stop Project, um, we were asked to after the bid process last week, we were asked to get figures and to come up with some solutions and to clarify some of the issues that um, members of council may have had with the project. Um, as you all know, this project started out in 2015. Um, this project was a part of, and this is just si simply the, um, the part that we're dealing with now, which is the recreational area. It was uh, part of the larger project, which was the the re uh, remodeling and um, retrofitting the facility uh, for use. So um, ended up coming before council for the, um, I should say the, uh, the meeting and it was determined that the actual project costs were in upwards of about $882,293 um, was what the project was, was gonna be uh, was going to come in at. Now there were some alternates that could be done um, to potentially change the scope of the project, but for the most part, that's roughly about where the project is. Um, we had about $1.7 million, $1.1 million, $7 million, $405 and 10 cents um, was what the original loan was, was taken out in 2016 all of which we have a remaining of $513,430 left. We also had a grant that was taken out um, and we have in that grant um, roughly 200, it was uh, 300, I'm sorry, yeah, it was roughly um, $295,000 $295, remaining in the grant. Um, and I believe it was I hope I got those numbers right. Um, but these are projects that were associated with the original Chavis One Stop project. So council will have to let me know at this point or give me some idea what direction you would like to go in. We do have a match in it at this point and that match is about $131,438 um, making total grant and loan um, roughly $1.1 million, which is well, um, which is enough to cover the entire project at this point. So there's nothing else that we would have to do. It will cover the entire project. Okay, is, is that, Madam Supervisor, is that inclusive of the prep work and everything? So um, we just got a quote back to have the grounds 
because that was not included in the original quote. Um, to have the clearing of the grounds, it was suggested that Public Works was going to do it, but um, we determined real quick that that wasn't going to be a good thing. So the projected amount that came up was, oh Lord, I think it's roughly around $110,000, which still keeps us in under budget for the project. It's $110 for grading and getting the site prepped for whatever's going to happen here. Um, the original design obviously was for a concession area, a um, football, field. football field, playground area, field lighting, uh, sidewalks tr well, that leads up to this area, and a track, as well as I believe it was also in there a um, little splash pad. And when we, when we say splash pads, we don't mean anything that's like large. I think it's four little stations there. Um, hmm? Wellness Right. Yeah. So four little stations there. So again, even with the additional costs associated with us prep doing um, the ground prepping, we are still under budget. But let me ask you, what we are talking about now, uh, when I heard the presentation a week or so ago, the scope of it has been reduced now to basically the construction of a football field and a concession stand. Is that not correct? Um, that'll come up to, what you said just a football field and that's alternate. Concession. Mm -hmm. Concession and football field. Mm -hmm. That cost, and, and you also have to add in the field lighting as well. Mm -hmm. um, that cost has been brought down, which I'm hoping that this is it. Oh, I gotta get my sheet. So yours is for just those items, it's 600, um, 600, $625,888 is what, um, no, let me metro down, $594,058. That's just for the basic area. That would include just the base stuff. And to add in um, the alternate stuff, which would be your field lighting, you're going to add on an extra $184,190. Mm -hmm. And then I believe that's it because you, um, I guess you all didn't want to do the splash pad or some sort. No. So basically you're looking at, you know, still um, a, a pretty decent cost, even if you go with alternate one. Okay, alternate one you said that was the I'm lighting. I'm sorry, alternate two. Oh, mm -hmm. The lighting. Mm -hmm. Okay, so what we're considering now is the lighting mm -hmm. of the football field, the construction of the concession stand, Mm -hmm. And um, was it football field lighting and what else was it? Uh, football lighting concession would be your other one, I would imagine. Yeah, concession, football, mm -hmm. and lighting. Mm -hmm. Those are the three items we're considering, right? Mm -hmm. Okay. And what you asking us? No, I'm just clearing it up because you and then the extra hundred thousand dollars for them to clear the land. Okay. But you said there's enough money for all of that. As you're well within budget for all of this. Okay. And this was approved in 2015 or when it started in 2015? 2015. And approved. we're well within budget. Now you are, yes. And you were you were in it either way. Whatever option you chose, you were still within it. Um, at this point, we have no word on being able to de-obligate any of the funding because the um, funding, like I said, it started, it was just a part of some other money that, you know, was the smaller picture. Um, and that's just the playground area. Should yeah. we move forward? Is there, is there, do we have a date when this will be completed? Um, well, the bids all came in and pretty much they're just waiting on uh, full council to go ahead and approve it based on what the bid, bid committee's recommendation is gonna be. And do we have an idea how the duration of the prog project, how long it will take? Mm -hmm. uh, I mean, he may have said something think, in the bid I committee meeting. I think he said, um, I don't recall what would the, the left Time length, time frame he gave us. But, um, yeah, I wasn't in the. No, I think it was. Well, well, like a year and a half, eighteen months, something along those lines. I year and a half. I think. Yeah. The, who did that meet, Joe? What? Were you in that meet with us? I don't uh, know. Yeah, I was. I was say six months. I was in okay. a couple of. Well, we can get the date. Okay, right. we'll, we'll get that. Now. I don't want to give out the wrong exactly. information. I don't recall exactly. Mm hmm. Uh, Madam Supervisor. May I address this issue? Yes, sir. Um, uh, 
You know, for the last uh, two years, we have been talking about how we don't uh, have money for this and we don't have money for that. And at one point, we, we stated that we just had too much stuff. And also, we've talked about some of the parks that we do have now, we want to get rid of them because they are uh, too expensive or they are causing expense on, on the county. Mm -hmm. And personally for me, for two years, and, and, and I campaigned on that very same thing, is that the county needed to cut back on their spending. There's a lot of things that come up that maybe we can get, but it's not necessary for us to get it. We don't really have to get it. And, um, you know, I feel very strongly about that. And since I use, and when I even talk to people in my district about that uh, swimming pool at uh, St. Lawrence, and we talked about repaying this swimming pool, and I just stood up and said, well, you know, this is not the time to uh, invest that money in a swimming pool. What about a splash pad? And, and even that. At that point, it was uh, costly. So, you know, after two years of uh, believing and going along with the idea that the county is in need of uh, this and we don't have to have this and have to have that, uh, at this point, either way, I could not vote for that. I stand out that. I think that if the money is there, if it's some kind of way we can improve some of the other parks, maybe we ought to do that. But to go in and get a new park or lighting and and more expenses, I, I just I just don't see it as a good uh, avenue to go now. And I, I couldn't possibly vote yay for that. It's not a new park. It's something that was already in, in existence that had been voted on and approved in 2015. All we were doing was the bids came back, the money came in for us to start the project. It's not a new park. It's something that was, like I said, it was voted on 2015 um, already. So I, you know, at this point, I'm, I work at the pleasure uh, in terms yeah. of I make the decisions according to what council wants me to do. Well, well, I think at this point, even though this, due to the fact that this was started a long time ago, now particularly, mm -hmm. I was not in favor of it in the beginning, but since it passed, and I know why um, this whole idea generated, um, but we've got grants money, grant monies, and we've got the financing in place. So if we do not do it, if we don't do that there, what's gonna happen to the grant money? That's the question. Will we lose that grant, the money go back? We no, we're not using it for what we designated it for. So at this point, we're kind of between a rock and a hard place, but the money is provided, the financing is in place. So I would say, I think we need to go ahead and do it, but I think we need to do the minimum. I like all those options, one, two, three, four, five. We don't need all of those, but we do have the financing in place and we have the, the capability of, of doing it with the bare minimum, the, 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 the football field, the lighting, and the concession stand. And I think I could support that, but anything beyond that and um, being outlandishly um, ridiculous, I think, uh, we need to go ahead and do it because we have the funding in place. That's just my take on it, and awesome. everyone got a got an opinion. Councilman Woods. Yes. Um, we're waiting to hear from the state to find out what options that we have available to us to um, de obligate maybe some of the remaining balances that we don't plan to use to see if we do take that action, is there a penalty? And what is the amount of the penalty for um, the obligate and any balances that we do not use for the concession, the football field, and the light? And so we're waiting to hear back from them. Okay, how, mu how much of the money has already been spent? 
Um, it's already the original, like I said, the original loan was for like one point seven million four hundred five dollars and ten cents. We have remaining five hundred and thirteen dollars, five hundred thirteen thousand four hundred and thirty dollars remaining in the loan amount. Um, and I believe we have two hundred and forty eight thousand seven hundred dollars left in the grant. I think somewhere around. Yeah. in the grant. So. Um, and then we have a match that we were holding, which is $131,438. Okay, so we. So it made the total a little over a million dollars. But of course, if you yeah. de obligate any portion of the grant, you know, you're going to take away from it. If you de obligate some of the loans, hopefully we don't have a penalty, but we've already, a lot of money has already been spent mm -hmm. in the architectural designs and all the changes made because it started out as a pool. Then it went to a splash pad. Now it's just a um, uh, football field. Well, I think I think it, it would be poor management on our part and not very frugal if we were to just abandon it right at this point and lose what we've already spent. Um, eighteen months. So eight to ten months. Okay. Eight to ten months. I thought you said eighteen. Okay. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. All right. Um, I think we are almost in a a situation where we have to. Well, no, we don't have to, but um, yeah. See, I don't know. That's just my take. I think we need to go ahead through with it. The time when we should have kicked against it was in the beginning, in the initial phases. But now we've gone this far. That's like going halfway across the river and just stop swimming. Field, like oh, grass cutting really and stuff, electricity and stuff like that. The same as with regular parks. Yeah. Right. It's same as lawn maintenance, um, uh, cleaning up the um, lawn maintenance, the lighting, electricity will be on there. Um, so those are some of the issues we're going to have to concern. Uh, probably putting a porter potty out there, etc. But so right now we maintain those issues anyways, right? Electrical, lawn care. Well, right now ain't nothing out there. Nothing out there, okay. Mm -hmm. And but we yeah. have, right now, with the, I just want to make sure I wrap my mind around this. The project that was agreed upon in 2015, we have spent um, over $500,000 of that loan. Is that correct? Well over that, like a little over $1.2 million. But see, that, that was one loan that was taken out for the retrofitting of the entire Chavis One Stop. Got you. Roof and stuff like that. So, And so if we move forward the pro with the project, we do have the monies in hand to complete the project. The only thing that we would have to do after the project is completed, which is projected to be eight to ten months, mm -hmm. is we would have to maintain lawn care and electricity and, of course, insurance. and insurance. Mm -hmm. Okay. Otherwise, we could, do, we, we could refund the loan, but we still have to pay for what we've already done and what we've already promised the citizens. Right, and then we don't know if there is going to be a penalty for the loan. Right, a penalty, right. And then also we're turning back in grant funding, which could also penalize us uh, if we were to try to apply for those funds again because we didn't use them. Oh, yeah, you're not going to get that again. Okay. Mm -hmm. oh, done. Like and I said, I think we're between a rock and a hard place. We almost have to go forward with it, but I think we need to do the minimum. That's what I think. No, 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 no. These are all just, this came from the bid committee, but they wanted to have the updates so that they can, um, and I think they did recommend it to yeah. full council, but so it'll be on the next agenda. Yeah. But I think they just wanted clarity on a lot of stuff. It's information <laughs> yes, of yes, absolutely, <laughs> absolutely. Um, any other questions, comments, or concerns regarding anything? So I'm asking uh, members of council, or sorry, I'm asking the Finance Committee meet uh, members um, to, number one, um, if we could vote to um, move or make recommendation, recommend to council, full council, um, the information that was presented by Mr. Um, Larry Finney. You mean to act on it? No, to make act? the recommendation to present it to regular council. Mm hmm what you're saying is just present it, not, rec not recommend to approve it. 
simply to Venting say this it. is the presentation that was presented to us, but not take any action on it. Right. Is, my, is that my understanding? Yes, sir, it is. Okay. Mm -hmm. I, I don't have a problem with that. No, we share the information. This is actually supposed to be a finance committee meeting, even though the majority of council is here. Mm -hmm. But you're making mm -hmm. a recommendation yes, to you share have, with the entire body at a, at, a, right. at a full council meeting. That's right. What we've done today, basically. But yes. I take action. Yes. Is that my understanding? Yes, sir. Is that, mm -hmm. is that my understanding correct? Is that my understanding? Okay. Mm -hmm. All right. <laughs> Motion that we um, share the meeting, share the information that we received today at this finance committee meeting with the entirety of council at next meeting. Yes, and that, in, that will include the rural fire, yes. um, the energy specialist group, as well as the budget review revisions, as well as Mr. Larry Finney's recommendation to be just only recommended for information to council during the next council meeting. Okay. And that's basically everything we've been over today. Yes. Is that, is that yes. correct? I would second that motion. All right. Any, the, um, any discussion? Hearing none, all those in favor, please signify by raising your hand. Posers, the same. It will be on, information will be placed on the next agenda for consideration. Thank you. Thank you, members of council, Williamsburg County citizens. So moved. Second. Any discussion? Hearing none, all those in favor, please signify by raising your hand. Opposers the same, we are adjourned. <laughs>